I'm going to begin talking about chapter 23 of Luke, the final chapter of his passion narrative. Jesus is brought before Pilate. So before this has been his interaction with the Jewish authorities. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the multitudes, I find no crime in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. When Pilate says, I find no crime in him, this is the first of three declarations of innocence on the part of the Roman on the scene. And the other thing I'll point out, I forgot to mention it in the last chapter, as Luke tells that story, there is no condemnation and they all condemned him as worthy of death. Uh, in Luke there's only one trial and it's a Roman trial. The thing before the Sanhedrin is like an informal inquest. They have enough evidence that now they're going to take him to Pilate for the trial but there is no Jewish trial in Luke. Then we have the scene before Herod which occurs only in Luke. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in gorgeous apparel, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. So here we have another Lucan portrayal of Jesus healing and reconciling during the Passion narrative. He healed the ear or the earlobe severed on the Mount of Olives. Here he heals the relationship of Pilate and Herod. Even his enemies are healed by coming into contact with him. Then we get the sentence of death. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Behold, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city, and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they shouted out, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no crime deserving death. I will therefore chastise him and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that their demand should be granted. 
he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder whom they asked for but Jesus he delivered up to their will so not guilty we hear the second and third declarations of Pilate the chief Roman magistrate on the scene has officially declared that Jesus is not guilty and more on this as we go along final note on this scene there is no scourging in 1833 the Luke and Jesus prophesying his passion had prophesied that he was going to be scourged when Luke wrote this back in chapter 18 did he forget that he was not going to include the scourging in his passion story or did Luke accidentally omit the scourging from his passion narrative forgetting that he had had Jesus prophesy it back in 18 uh, there's an inconsistency in Luke here all cried out together this is the only place in Luke that portrays all the Jewish people opposed to Jesus usually he is more nuanced and more gentle with the portrayal of the people he will later soften this by the story of the daughters of Jerusalem who weep for Jesus that's the next section and by the portrayal of the people at the cross and more on that when we get there so the way of the cross and as they led him away they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus and there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who bewailed and lamented him but Jesus turning to them said daughters of Jerusalem do not weep for me but weep for yourselves and for your children for behold the days are coming when they will say blessed are the barren the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never gave suck then they will begin to say to the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us for if they do this when the wood is green what will happen when it is dry uh, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him so we have the women of Jerusalem and they are wailing and lamenting for Jesus this softens the portrait of all of the people being opposed to Jesus also when Luke is writing the year 80 or 85 it's been 10 or 15 years since Jerusalem was destroyed and if you read the descriptions in ancient historians it was a very gory and bloody time and a lot of people then probably were wishing that they were never born themselves a lot of women were wishing probably that they had never born their sons and daughters who were being slaughtered and enslaved the two criminals the Greek it's literally two evildoers what's interesting is that he deliberately changes the word lastes which is often translated as robber but a more accurate translation would be terrorist it would be like some of the drug gangs that if your band of robbers is big enough to give a Roman platoon trouble then as far as the Romans were concerned you were a terrorist you were a revolutionary against the civic order Luke wants to avoid any association of Jesus with those type of terrorist revolutionaries and so he doesn't say as do Mark and Matthew that Jesus was crucified with one lay stace on this side and another lay stace on that side he says he was crucified with two evildoers the crucifixion and when they came to the place which is called the skull there they crucified him and the criminals one on the right and one on the left and Jesus said father forgive them for they do not know what they do and they cast lots to divide his garments 
And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our own deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. There it is again, innocent. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So, Father, forgive them. Some manuscripts contain these words. Other manuscripts do not. Did Luke write them, or were they added by Christian scribes? Probably Luke wrote them. As time passed, early Christianity became more and more anti-Jewish. By the time we get to the second century Gospel of Peter, Pilate washes his hands and leaves the trial and the Jewish king Herod condemns Jesus to death. It's getting more and more anti-Jewish. Some scribes would not believe that Jesus actually wanted the people who crucified him to be forgiven and so they left that line out. So probably Luke did write it and some scribes deliberately left it out. The other rebuked him, the so-called good thief. And I say so-called good thief because Luke doesn't use the word thief, which is translating lestes. More accurately, it would be the good terrorist. But Luke doesn't use that word. This is one of several instances found only in Luke, Jesus healing and forgiving even during his passion. The severed ear being healed only in Luke. Pilate and Herod being reconciled only in Luke. Forgiving the executioners only in Luke. Then we have mockery. And notice the focus here is not on pain. Contrast medieval piety and movies based on medieval piety that people think are scriptural, like Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, that stress and relish in every moment of pain. But here, more ink is given to the mockery than to the pounding of nails. And Luke deliberately or by accident didn't even give a bit of ink to the scourging that got, you know, forever in Mel Gibson's movie. Why? Because the mockery is an allusion to the Psalms, especially Psalm 22. All who pass by wag their head. Christians saw these similarities as fulfillment of scriptures, which was their way of saying, this is all God's plan. So the early Christian task is to deal with the shame of the cross, not with the pain of the cross. And in one line, Paul says, heedless of the shame. He went to his death. The people stood by. In Luke, none of the people mock Jesus while he's on the cross. Contrast Matthew and Mark, where it's the fulfillment of scriptures. All who pass by wag their head. They portray everyone as mocking Jesus. For Luke, it's the chief leaders, the Jewish leaders, and the soldiers who are mocking, but the people simply stand by and watch. And in John, there's no mocking by anyone once Jesus is on the cross, because that's part of the lifting up process, the glorification, and more on that when we do John. Then we get the line, Jesus, remember me. When God remembers, remember we talked about Moses and Noah, when God remembers, he acts to save. Here, the dying criminal makes this divine request of Jesus. Remember me. 
I'll tell you what, this would be a good place to break. Okay.